This has really been a field which has been relatively ignored. In the early 1960s, President John F. Kennedy was influenced by a passionate advocate for people living with special needs. That advocate was the president's sister, Eunice. I love to be with my special friends, and I like to learn from them. I learn from persistence, I learn guts, guts, I learn courage. Hi, how are you? How are you? I'm Anthony Shriver, how are you doing? Nice to meet you. Nice to see you. Today, more than 50 years later, Eunice's son, Anthony Kennedy Shriver, carries on the family legacy. People with, you know, special abilities need just everything just like my own kid needed. Do you love your job? I love it. <laughs> a lot. <laughs> That's coming up today on 50 Plus Prime. Thank you for joining us. I'm Tony Fama. In the 1960s, President John F. Kennedy challenged the nation. He demanded excellence. He wanted a man on the moon within the decade. He envisioned a government health insurance program for the nation's senior citizens. He had big ideas, and many of them were focused on the little guy, on the people who, for a variety of reasons, struggled. He supported civil rights. He was committed to helping rural areas escape poverty. And then there was this idea. He wanted people living with intellectual and developmental disabilities to enjoy their lives to the best of their abilities. Now, that idea had his sister Eunice written all over it. And as we are about to see, Anthony Kennedy Shriver, Eunice's son and the president's nephew, has committed his life to making sure that the idea so important to his mom and his uncle will today benefit millions of people with special needs around the world. Yeah. This guy's great. He's in charge of it all. <laughs> Got it down. No, no, that's too much responsibility. <laughs> we went along with Anthony Kennedy Shriver on his visit to see 36-year-old Dwayne Chin Loy. Where do you hang out, Dwayne? My spot is right here, sir. Wow, nice. Right in the corner. Well, I get the computer, the whole thing. Yeah. What's this? It's thing helped do? me to be a more confident person, individual, and then it, it it'll trickle down into into all aspects of, of my life as far as like. Um, having a financial stability. Yeah. And then this is Sean over here. Yeah. The COO, right? Is that C right? Hi, how are you? COO. Gratifying. Yeah, it's great, right? What could be better, right? Guy feels included, he's part of the team. You get a salary, you got the uniform. That's what it's all about. You just need about a million of these, and then we're set. <laughs> then I can retire, call it a day. You're on your way. <laughs> yeah, we're getting there. one day at a time. That first day came in 1987, when Shriver, a student at Georgetown University, Open the initial chapter of Best Buddies. Thought it would be a great experience, a uh, great part of being in college for other students to be exposed to this incredible network of people that are out there. They were usually sort of very much segregated and isolated, especially in the 80s. Two years later, in 1989, Best Buddies officially opened for business. Best Buddies provides opportunities for friendship, leadership development, and jobs for people with intellectual and developmental disabilities. With the emphasis on integration, Best Buddies teams volunteers worldwide with people living with special needs. It's an idea rooted in Anthony Shriver's childhood. You know, it was a little bit unusual, obviously, to have all these, you know, hundreds of people with intellectual disabilities in your backyard. And, you know, nobody else and, you know, none of my friends had stuff like that going on. So it was definitely, you saw it as something a little bit strange and different. Um, but my mother was a little bit different and a little bit strange in some people's mind. <laughs> um, in a great way, though, you know, right? So she did it her way and, you know, rolled to her own beat. Anthony's mother was Eunice Kennedy Shriver, President John F. Kennedy's sister. In September 1962, Eunice published an article in the Saturday Evening Post entitled Hope for Retarded Children. In it, she shared the story of her sister Rosemary's struggle with special needs. She... Uh, drove her to, you know, uh, recognize that, or to create some level of anger, actually, that she was so cut out. And she was really cut out originally, as we all know now, from my family for a really long period of time. It was a different era, you know, obviously in the 40s and the 50s, but she was really isolated, um, you know, living in Wisconsin for, you know, close to 20 years with no contact from anybody in the family. That was a good 40 years ago. And I can't think of a positive uh, experience, really, for our special friends in our age. They had no special education. They had no special sports. It's very hard in the classroom here in the sixth grade to try to compete against somebody who's doing math or geography. 
But if you can go uh, with that same person out in a field and play a sport, uh, our special friend will excel. And from that observation came the Special Olympics, founded by Eunice Kennedy Shriver in 1968, with opening games held at Chicago's Soldier Field. Today, many of you will win. But even more important, I know you will be brave and bring credit to your parents and to your country. Let us begin the Olympics. Thank you. Special Olympics' unofficial beginning came in the early 1960s, when Eunice introduced Camp Shriver at Timberlawn, the family's Maryland farm. It was at Timberlawn that the spirit of Special Olympics came to life, when 34 special needs children were teamed with high school and college student counselors at a groundbreaking summer camp. But for a kid, it was so fun because, you know, you had so many people and we were in the pool and we were on horses and we were you know, doing, you know, races and track and field races and doing obstacle courses and playing tennis and, you know, it's, uh, it's just a great environment. It was Eunice who influenced her brother to focus the resources of the federal government in support of people with special intellectual needs. This has really been a field which has been relatively ignored. Now we hope to put a greater light on it in this country, in other countries around the world. It knows no national frontiers. And I hope that in the 1960s, these years will be known as years in which the United States took the leadership in the great effort to make it possible to discover what we can do to make these boys and girls' life more hopeful and fruitful. President Kennedy signed legislation authorizing federal funds to build nonprofit community health centers to assist people living with developmental disabilities. And he issued an executive order encouraging all branches of the federal government to consider hiring people with special needs. You know, today in the United States, that 3% of the children grow up mentally retarded. Could you imagine that 2% of our children live in mental retardation who could be saved if we had the program and the recognition of the need? And those of us who have seen children live in the shadow know that a country as rich as ours are possibly justified in neglect. After President Kennedy was sworn in, he used to joke that he feared seeing Eunice because Eunice always had an agenda. I think, you know, President Kennedy didn't really understand how big of an issue this was and how important it could be to his administration and to his legacy and how this population was so vast and huge and spread out all over the globe and how uh, disenfranchised they truly were and isolated and segregated they were and that, you know, that was what he believed in in his core, it was part of his values and I think she gave him the opportunity to focus in on this population. It was into a family committed to public service that Anthony Shriver was born. Eunice Kennedy Shriver was one passionate voice in support of people in need, but she wasn't a lone voice. Mr. Shriver, do you really believe that poverty can be wiped out? Yes, I do. Uh, I disagree with those who feel that grinding poverty, the kind of poverty I mean is the kind of poverty where you have very bad medical care, very bad housing, very bad education, that kind of poverty does not need to exist in the United States any longer. It can be wiped out. When we come back, the dynamic partnership of Sergeant Shriver and Eunice Kennedy and its impact on their son, Anthony. Welcome back. Sergeant Shriver and Eunice Kennedy were a great team. They were smart, persuasive, charismatic, and committed to helping people on the margins of society, people who had the greatest need but had the least level of support. Their son Anthony watched all of this. He watched them in action, and he decided he wanted to be just like them. Sergeant Shriver and Eunice Kennedy married in 1953, and together their shared commitment to helping the less fortunate touched the lives of millions worldwide. In a speech before the National Press Club, Shriver shared the lighthearted phone conversation he had with President Kennedy when the president offered him the job to run a new agency called the Peace Corps. On the phone he said, um, listen, you've got to come down here to Washington to run the Peace Corps. And I said, well, Mr. President, you know, I don't know anything about any Peace Corps. And he said, well, that's all right, neither does anybody else. And I said, but yes, but remember all the political debts you incurred during the campaign. 
why don't you give this uh, job to one of your political friends? <clears throat> he said, listen, Sarge, the truth of the matter is that everybody thinks the Peace Corps is going to be one of the greatest fiascos in history. It turns out that way it's much easier to fire a relative than a political friend. <laughs> Since its beginnings in 1961, the Peace Corps has placed more than 220,000 volunteers from age 18 to 86 in more than 140 countries, assisting in efforts to improve health care, education, security, and economic growth. In a 1965 speech about the role of the Peace Corps, Shriver spoke about how worldwide poverty and the struggle for self-determination together played a central role in threatening peace. And the reason is that there's actually only one war going on. This war has erupted in the African Congo, down in Santo Domingo, in the Dominican Republic, down in Panama, about the canal, out in what? And all of these riots or wars are related, not because they're communists or extremists or whatever you want to say, ready to exploit every disturbance here or abroad, but because hunger and ignorance and disease exist in stark reality for billions of people. And because millions of people have been denied elementary political freedom and political rights. Shriver's work in leading President Lyndon Johnson's war on poverty still resonates today, more than 50 years later. Um, and Daddy, you know, on the war on poverty was giant. I mean, the war on poverty created so many of the most important organizations that exist today, from, you know, Job Corps to VISTA to um, foster grandparents to so many of the uh, legal services for the poor, um, so many um, job training programs that exist today as well for uh, inner city kids. Um, so many of those things that we take for granted today all started under daddy's leadership on the war on poverty and obviously LBJ. Growing up in the Shriver household, where the importance of helping the less fortunate was modeled every day, made an impact on Anthony that has guided his life's work. And it makes you want to wake up in the morning and go at it and crush it every day and, and think about what you do and the potential is the whole globe, you know, to continue to go. You're not working in a state or you're not working just in one city. You know, you're working on the, you know, on the earth. And it's, you know, they made it seem so great. So the idea of going and doing something other than this kind of work in the social space was kind of like unappealing or like you can't, I, can't, I couldn't imagine it. So for Anthony, in a world where 200 million people live with intellectual and developmental disabilities and the social, physical, and economic isolation that can come with it, Best Buddies was a logical step. What you would do is go up on the um, sporting goods. Latiana Harris is one of the 1.2 million people worldwide impacted by Best Buddies. Latiana's a greeter at Aventura Mall in Miami. I love it. I love interacting with the customers. They give me good energy, good vibe, everything. So. We have this store called The Unknown. Christopher Park is also a mall greeter. He, like Latiana, found his job through Best Buddies. Basically, my job is what to do. It make, a, it make all, all visitors around, all around the country. Make them, make them feel welcome. Make them feel welcome. And I know you do that. Yes, I basically, yes. Do you like your job, Christopher? I love it. <laughs> <laughs> I can tell. <laughs> I love it. Oh, thank you. Okay. Gary Dinkins is all about keeping the mall nice and tight. And I talk to a lot of people. <laughs> Do you like talking to a lot of people? Love it. I am, I am very social. You are very social. I see that. <laughs> you know, one of the important things that we all want in life is respect. People want to feel respected, that they contribute, that they matter, that they count, that they're on the planet for a reason, and that God's got a purpose for every single human being, which I believe he does. So I think giving them an opportunity to share their purpose and their passion and their talent that's God-given is important to create that platform for them, and I want to keep doing that. They got some, but they're not going to do it. But is that okay? John Kerry is Senior Vice President of Operations at Park West Gallery in Miami. He's hired four employees from Best Buddies since 2015. Oh, they're fantastic. I mean, there's always with a smile. I mean, they're always here. Um, rarely do you have an issue, attendance issue. Yeah, there isn't any. It's just, it's a joy to be with them each and every day. Lazaro Quintero is 22 and a Best Buddies alumni. For six months, 
He's been touching up paintings at Park West Gallery. I love it. It's one of like my big dreams to work here. What I love about working at this company is that people treat you like family. And when you come here, everybody welcomes you and you just feel like home. I think, you know, people with intellectual and development disabilities aren't different than anybody else, certainly not different than me. I think if I didn't have the proper care and support, I wouldn't be sitting here with you today and I wouldn't be productive. You know, God knows where I'd be. Next, Anthony Shriver and his best buddies have received support from some of the biggest names in U.S. sports and entertainment. That's when we come back. Welcome back. No matter how great a leader might be, she or he cannot do it alone. You just can't do it without support. Anthony Shriver knows that. He's as smart as he is committed to making sure people with special needs lead healthy, happy, and productive lives. So he's built a support team, and it is formidable. It's a who's who list of some of the nation's leading celebrities. Hi, I'm Tom Brady. Think about your best buddy, that friend you can always count on, who likes you just the way you are. Well, Support from the nation's marquee athletes and entertainers has helped best buddies, best buddies benefit people with special needs in 50 countries. From New England Patriots quarterback Tom Brady to former Dallas Cowboys running back Emmett Smith, actors Pierce Brosnan and Marley Matlin, and Hollywood director Ron Howard, Anthony Shriver's supporting cast guarantees the spotlight that his mission needs to succeed. So, I mean, I see it in my own children who have a lot of advantages that they need constant support and encouragement and they need constant help outside of the structured environment that's provided. Uh, and sometimes I look at myself and I go, I don't know how people do it because my God, my kids can barely keep up and I'm just pumping everything under the sun into them. Anthony and Alina Shriver have five children. Their daughters, Eunice and Francesca, accompanied their dad during our visit. And what a visit it was. I even got a tour of Anthony Shriver's office which amounts to a mini museum of U.S. history. Yeah, it's good. So these are just some family yes. photos. That's when my dad ran for vice president with George McGovern. This is an article on when President Kennedy launched a challenge to go to the moon, which is great. What a treasure you have here. Yeah, so it's good. I've got a lot more in my house, but it's good. It's a funny uh, photo I took my dad. This is with President Clinton here, actually, in Miami. Uh, <laughs> that kind of political leaders. It's a great picture here of my... Um, Uncle Jack coming, going to Ireland with my mother, uh, which is one of his most famous trips when he was president. Mm -hmm. And uh, this is a fun picture of me and my daughter Eunice Kennedy Shriver II in the lawn there, my grandparents' lawn, Joseph and Rose Kennedy in Hyannisport, Massachusetts. That's the lawn where they all grew up, and that's this summer in Hyannisport. Wow. It's a funny letter handwritten by President Kennedy when he was a student at Choate asking his mother, uh, if he could be uh, Teddy's godfather. <laughs> Read that for us, yeah, would you, please? Yeah, dear mother, um, it's the night before exam, so I will um, write you Wednesday. Lots of love. <laughs> P.S. Can I be godfather to Teddy? <laughs> Everybody would like to see is my Aunt Rosemary oh, at my house my in goodness. Hyannisport, Massachusetts, when she was older, but this was on the July 4th weekend. Um, and that's the driveway in Hyannisport going down to our family's home. Beautiful. Um, but yeah, there she is. This is a fun one. I'm a little messy here, but this is one of my favorite ones. It's a picture of my mom and me. This is a little walkway below our house in Hyannisport that goes to the beach. Um, and me carrying her in the 20s, but it was, yeah. And is this Muhammad Ali I see here today? Yeah, that's with Joey. He was good. He came to a lot of our events. That's Joey, Joseph Patrick Kennedy Shriver, when he was a little baby. <laughs> but he came to a lot of the galas that we did for Best Buddies to raise money. And he was super generous and nice to us, and he's a great guy. I have today announced uh, my intention to appoint a panel of outstanding scientists, doctors, and others to prescribe a program of action in the field of mental retardation. Friends, ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the third National Special Olympic Games. And to you young athletes, congratulations. How we all wish here on the speaker stand that we could perform like you will in the next two days. You will run faster, you will swim faster, you will jump and throw farther than most of us in the stands ever will dream of doing. You are the true champions and we are proud of you.
the commitment to people with special needs began all those years ago. I love to be with my special friends, and I like to learn from them. I learn from persistence, I learn guts, guts, I learn courage. This is the future. For love, for hope, for faith, and to bring peace and to bring excellence to our special friends through sports. It continues today through Anthony Shriver's best buddies, built on a foundation of family committed to celebrating the human spirit. And it makes everybody better and it makes people feel the value and the beauty of human life and that God creates everybody for a reason and that everybody's got a great gift to give and to share and, and they contribute in all different ways. Next on Anthony Shriver's best buddies to-do list is housing. He wants to make sure that people with special needs have safe, comfortable, and peaceful homes to return to every night. If you'd like more information on Best Buddies, please visit bestbuddies.org. I'm Tony Fama. This is 50 Plus Prime. Thank you for joining us. What I, do, I believe this, this is my passion. Yeah, you're a good man. Uh, and you've got a beautiful smile. Thank you. <laughs> and I'm sure you make a lot of people here smile when you greet them. Yes. They make you feel like... They make them feel like, I make them feel like my friends, I'm like sure. my family. You do. It's a pleasure to meet you. Nice to meet you too. Thank you, buddy. We were walking, we walked by here, but now you can see. This is just an extension of office services. Right here, we normally got two or three people working okay. there. Wow, you got a lot of people in office services. And some extra, extra um, equipment, like paper cutters.